Hi, this is Carl. Welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. I'm joined today by Jeff Ponce, who is a friend of mine and uh, kind of a local. We live 20 miles away from each other, maybe. And uh, Jeff is with Datatel Solutions. He's the executive VP and founder and also uh, has a separate company called Concordus Apps, right? Concordus Applications? Yes, Concordus Applications. Welcome, sir. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and Datatel and uh, kind of how you fit into this community. Yeah, and, and good afternoon, Carl. And it's always, to Carl's point, Carl and I usually see each other quite often, but it's usually in a different uh, city. Instead we we of, met and, in Seattle. We did, yeah. And, and, and we see each other all over the place. And we were just talking about a trip. We'll see each other in, in Vegas in a couple months at, at CompTIA's ChannelCon, but we very rarely see each other in our own backyards. Um, so, so uh, as far as data tell solutions go, uh, it's a master agency in the telecom space. Uh, started 16 years ago, and with the focus working with bars and now MSPs. The term bar wasn't even really a term back then, but uh, um, you know there was plenty of master agents at the time already set up, and so we decided to work with a, a group of people that were really being underserved at the time. Of course, now if you talk to a master agent, it's very sexy to work with an MSP. Right. Um, everybody wants to because they quite, fr frankly, there's a very limited amount of telecom agents. And so, but the, you know, there's a, there's a vast amount of MSPs. So to them, they, they want, that's their growth, but we've always been there. So it's interesting. We were, before we started recording, talking about the good old days, you know, and we'll put in some harp music here, you know, but uh, I first set up, connectivity for a company in 1993. So it was before the internet was open to the public. Um, and I can't remember the price, but we bought in those days a fractional T1. We literally bought one sure. channel of a T1. And the big thing then was, you know, oh, you had a, a T3 or, you know, an OC3. And now all of that stuff is literally the slowest internet in the world. Uh, so it's, it's quite a, a change when you say you go back 16 years. Um, you, one of the things you always tell me is how, how difficult it becomes every year to continue to make the same amount of money in telecom. It is. You know, we used to always joke, right? That, you know, it was a race to zero. You know, the price was a race to zero. That was a joke. But it looks like it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as funny and, as you used No, to. no. So, so to your example, you know, um, even, you know, when I started the company, you know, 16 years ago, or maybe a little bit before that, I've been in the business for 30 years, um, but we were selling $2,000 T1s. And they were mostly so that, you know, that was, they were mostly for dedicated long distance because people were paying a buck for long distance and we were taking them down to 50 cents, 30 cents a minute for long distance. That's you. And we were selling those all day long. So you'd look somebody square in the face and say, I'm going to charge you $2,000 for 1.54 megs. So exactly. the answer, yeah. So an OC48, you know, that was 622 uh, megs, right? I, we used to sell those for $50,000 a month. Wow. And and just a couple of weeks ago, we, we sold a gig. So, you know, six, you know, 40% more bandwidth uh, inside of a data center for $583. Man. Well, and here's what's interesting. And I won't name names, so you don't have to if you don't choose to. But some of the telecoms have a reputation of being just plain evil. And a uh, perfect example. I remember I had a client in uh, mid-90s who got talked into a fractional T1 and I think was paying $900 a month for a you know 56K line and then saw that the same company was now selling, you know, whatever it was, two megs of, of connectivity on a DSL line uh, for $300 a month or something like that. And so she tried to cancel and they said, no, 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 you signed a three-year contract. You can't cancel. And so she stopped paying and eventually she sued them and she lost because they were like, sorry, you know, it doesn't matter whether we've dropped the price to everybody else. My, our ongoing customers still have to pay the high price. And that's, the kind of thing that makes people really, really angry. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, that hasn't changed. That the, you know, the, the numbers have changed. They're 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 greatly reduced, um, but uh, it is still the the same. You know, we you know we sign customers to three year contracts all the time, but we also have it in our in our uh, 
uh, CRM to make sure we're contacting those customers when there's six months left on the contract to see what they want. Generally, we find now that they're not necessarily looking for uh, less cost, they're looking for more bandwidth. And so a lot of times we're doubling, tripling their bandwidth for, for the same output they have now. Right. That's amazing. So um, one of the great regrets, I only have two regrets in the entire life of my business. Uh, one is the day that I walked into a bar and realized that somebody was getting $4,000 to sell these guys a, a TV and they bought 10 TVs, right? <laughs> and I didn't get any of that. The, the other thing is, if I could go back and remake one decision in my business, it would be to sell more telecom. I just literally early on in the 90s, 93, 94, 95, I just decided I wasn't going to sell connectivity. And I wish I had. I, I sold a tiny bit, but I never sold much. I didn't make it an important part of my business. And if I could go back and redo my life, that's one big decision I would make. Yeah, you know, we, we even to this day, we have a lot of partners that we're sending very large checks to on a monthly basis. You know, a couple of them uh, six figure on a monthly basis, you know, and, and recurring, all recurring revenue. Yeah, I still get some telephone recurring revenue, but not I, not the connectivity, just the telephone. Yeah, no, we, we still have some partners that are just making a, a, a ton of money. And, and it is, you know, we started this thing 16 years ago. It was all recurring revenue. That's how this thing starts. When, when MSP start talking about recurring revenue, what it does for their business, I'm thinking, yeah, I know that's always what it's been. <laughs> But, he, but here's what the real value recurring revenue has been to me is it allowed me to take risks. And mostly they paid off, but sometimes they didn't. But the risk I, but it, I, was, I was risking, you know, capital, but I knew I was going to have additional capital coming in the next month and the next month and the next month. And it, and, and it, it has always grown. Even, even today, it, it grows a little bit, but, let, but it, uh, on, 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 the, on the telecom side, it, uh, it's a lot harder. But you're not growing it because of bandwidth. You're, you're building it because of, you know, unified communications, hosted VoIP products uh, like that. So, so one of the things that's interesting is that it's harder and harder to make money off of this. And I think you told me that the, the cost of everything basically goes down about 20% a year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, it does. So uh, that means that even with the recurring revenue, as there are, as people refresh and renew and so forth, you know, right. it still goes down, down. Yes. Uh, so you have to keep working at it. But are we, I hear all this talk about uh, 5G, SD-WAN, you know, that kind of stuff. Are we entering an era where suddenly we're all going to become hardware resellers again and, and uh, put in all that new infrastructure and make a bunch of money? Yeah, you know, there, there's, there's two things that are going to happen, what you're going to see. Uh, and you've seen it over the course of the last, you know, three, three to five years is the merging of telecommunications providers. You know, whether it was a big, the big ones like a CenturyLink, uh, and, and level three, you saw Verizon buy XO, um, you know, um, Paytech was purchased by Windstream and also bought Earthlink. And uh, a lot of these are kind of, they're not buying them because there's this, um, this great synergy. They're buying it to keep their, their head above water a little bit longer, right? So there's an economy of scale, right? You got two right. companies together, you, you lay off 5,000 people and, and you keep your head above uh, uh, the water for a little bit longer. That's really what uh, you've, you've seen in the past. Now you're starting to see some master agents start to to emerge also, and it, it, that's going to continue to happen. And to answer the second part of your uh, question, so yeah, a little bit, right? So we're, we are going to go back into the um, uh, to the hardware business. I'll give you an example of that. So, you know, we like to talk about 5G. You know, 5G is still a few years off. We'll talk about it forever and when's it going to be. And, and the answer is, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Somebody but, pointed out that AT&T already has their icon on their cell phone. Yeah, how about that for marketing, <laughs> right? That's <laughs> pure marketing. But, but, but you know, look, there, there's Beta City. Sacramento is a Beta City for uh, Verizon right now. But I, I was on a call not too long ago with Verizon, and they told me that it was going to take 10,000 um, hubs or, you know, uh, antennas to light up Manhattan. 10,000, because... It, 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 because it, the, the signal isn't the same signal as your 4G signal. It doesn't go yeah. through Five Gs buildings. Is, is a much higher frequency, so it doesn't trap yeah. as far. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So they're going to need 10,000. And they're still dealing with the whole health thing and the radiation and all that. I'm sure they're going to figure that out, put whatever box around it. Um, but, 
but it's, it's going to take a huge investment, not just in, in capital, but the spectrum, which was a lot of capital. Um, so, but, but imagine this, you know, your, you know, your MSP, you know, customer wants a circuit up, you know, right now, someone says, I want fiber. I want a gig of fiber to my, to my office. And there's not fiber to that building. You're looking at six months before that thing gets installed. So if I um, sold, if I sold something today, it's six months before it gets installed. And it's nine months before I'm going to see my first paycheck, by the way. Wow. That's a, that, that's a long time. So let's move this forward to a few years from right now. So as quickly as you know, you go online and you buy your 5G uh, signal, um, you know, you're going to call your MSP. And as quickly as they can get out there, they're going to, they're going to go hook a box up to that. And that box, you know, they're, they're, that box might be a router. That box might be SD-WAN with a router, with a firewall, whatever. So – so you're partially right. It, you know, they're, 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 we're going to be hanging hardware again, but the difference is instead of taking six months, it could be the next day. If, if, right. if the MSP has time, it has the field guys, it could literally be the next day. So do you think that we're entering an era where the hardware will be ready for it? Like I'll have a 5G ready router before – I have a uh, a telco that's ready yeah, to give it yeah, to me. There, well, there's already. I, I you know I I'm not sure um, what brands are out there. I believe Datto has one. I think Josh told me that that Datto has one. One of the all-in-one boxes. You know the firewall, SD WAN, uh, router. I mean the you know the, the, uh, everything combined. You know if the if the MSB has those sitting on their on their floor someplace they could literally install it the next day or order it and put it up in a few days right uh, so the services are still going to go towards the cloud but you still need those boxes for your security for uh, you know for other uh, for other reasons optimization in particular oh, so the the promise of sd wan is that that firewall can be out on the network and i no longer need a piece of hardware in my office i just need connectivity and if the signal's fast enough I can just have it all filtered before it shows up in my office. Yeah, good guys. Are, the bad guys are pretty good at what they do. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I'd go with that. I think I'd go. I. I still would like to have a, it layered. So, um, what do you do exactly to help many service providers? like get into this business and make money? Yeah, well, look, our secret sauce has always been doing the heavy lifting, right? Uh, we have a different DNA. I've got eight telecom engineers. They got, all of them have more than 20 years experience. And our, our MSPs like us because they just pick up the phone and call us or send an email saying, that I need this. And my guys are not only going to go figure out what's the two or three providers that are at that location. They're going to look at different ways to get that there. You know, customer might want DR, you know, um, customer might be in the middle of nowhere. And the only thing they can get is satellite. I mean, so we're going to go out there. We're going to not just find out what vendors are at that location. We're going to find out which is the best breed, but even the best of breed isn't that good, <laughs> right? There's, there's, there's always installation issues and things like that. And we actually take care of that. So we make sure we stay in the middle of that transaction all the way till it's installed and billing to make sure that the, the customer, the in customers are getting what they need. But most importantly, we're making the MSP's customer happy that they're doing business with the MSP. Without that, they're really, you know, there's no point to it as even right. being in business. Oh, I love uh, one time you told me that it's all about dividing up a hundred pennies. I, I just love that vision of like, oh, this is how we make money is we just figure out how many pennies Carl gets and how many pennies Jeff gets. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like complicated comp, uh, comp plans. And if it has to be complicated, I don't think it's going to be very good because somebody's going to be taken advantage of. So that's what I do. I always say, look, I, I didn't make that rule. There's a hundred pennies on every dollar, no more, no less. Who gets what? Right. <laughs> and if you can't tell me that, I don't want to do business. So when a, when a, an MSP comes to you, they say, Hey, I like, for example, I, I got this client, here's their address. What can I sell them? How do I make money? you then go do some research and, and figure out probably the best thing to sell them. Well, the good news about MSPs is they generally know what their customer needs are, right? They, you know, uh, you know, are there apps on-prem? Are they cloud-based? Are, you know, are they adding applications that they need more bandwidth? Half the time is more bandwidth, to be honest with you. I, we need more, we need more, be, and because right. the customers are adding, and that, that's fairly simple, you know, but, you know, but there's different vendors that do different things. For an example, some customers just want the cheapest thing. They want cheap coax service to their office capable. There's no SLAs behind that. 
And that's okay if that's what the customer is willing to live with. We always suggest having, you know, uh, some backup behind that, right? Right. And so, uh, so there's, you know, so we always try to make, you know, give advice, you know, to to our partners. And um, so, so again, it's it's their customer, not our customer. But we know they're not going to come back. That MSP is not going to pick up the phone and call us again if we didn't back them up. Right. So our model is not a quote and hope model, as as, as <laughs> some do, right? You know, so we don't just go sign contracts with with big carriers and just manage commissions, right? We're not a commission mill. We actually do the heavy lifting and get in the weeds, and that fits some people and other people. It, it they don't want us touching anything. That's that's fine. And so, in you know, you know, there might be some of the big master uh, national master agents that might fit them a little better because they don't want any help doing anything, but we're. We've, we've built out a kind of a core of, and we we're part of their teams. We're part of our MSPs. Teams. And do you have different relationships that, that uh, pay different models? Basically, like if I'm willing to be the first point of contact, I make so much money. If I want you to do everything, I make well, less money. Well, that's, a, that's all negotiable, right? It goes two ways. One, the answer is yes. If, you, if, the, if the agent wants to do all the heavy lifting, of course I'm going to pay more because I don't have the same cost structure. If they want us to do everything, literally call the customer. I mean, we have partners that say, call the customer, he's expecting your call, and take care from there, close it, do everything. And we might pay that person 50% of the, of the deal. There might be another partner who is doing literally everything. I mean, like they said, they'll just tell us when they close the deal. We'll probably close, pay them 80% of what we make because we really don't have that much, you know, invested in, into that transaction other than, you know, managing the relationship with the vendors, which has its own uh, pain points for right. sure. Uh, so, so, and also uh, volume, you know, we've got people who do a ton of volume with us. I pay them yeah. more, even if we do all the heavy lifting because, well, they're, they're you know, they're a good customer. Right. They're, they're feeding you. <laughs> yes, they're feeding. <laughs> so, and by the way. You just had a vacation with your wife. Congratulations. Yeah. First, first, first vacation in 26 years without a kid. How about that? That's <laughs> still, I'm a well, that's congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let me go back to the hardware piece of it. So when we talk about building out all these 5g networks and all of the antennas we need and all that, are those really big antennas that I see no, on buildings going no away? No, they're small. It's not as much about – well, remember, 4G is a different kind of – I'm not sure how long it's going to take till 4G goes away, if, if at all. Because remember, you got the rural communities, and I'm not – it's going to be a long time until the rural communities and, and, the, and the smaller cities uh, are on 5G because it's a big investment, right? You have to have right. a lot of people on there for the ROI. So I don't, I don't see that going away for, for – for quite some time, but no, it's a smaller antenna. It's more the box than the antenna um, for for five G. But now they're right now they're trying to figure out how do we encase how do we encase this thing without putting off a bunch of radiation because that's a big fear right now, and it, and I think it's a warranted fear. Well, so I hearken back to the days of fiber, and we you know we have a local company here that spent a ton of money putting fiber in the ground so they could go bankrupt. <laughs> and then eventually that got bought 10 cents on the dollar by a company who lit it up and made a bunch of money. You're talking uh, about West. And yeah, and that yes. happens all over the United States. Are we going to see something similar course, with 5G? I, I, you know what? I don't know. Um, you know, right, right now there are, there, there's, a, there's a large association of rural telcos. And there, I believe there's like 1,200 members. And they're old, small school, small town telcos. You know, we're, look where we live. It's Ro Ro there, it was Roosevelt Telecom, right? But at least the Sacramento region was a big enough area where they could expand and grow. A lot of these are in small towns across the country. And are they going to invest in 5G or are they going to just try to partner? And I don't know the answer. I think it would be a huge mistake for them to try to do it themselves because it's so, it's so capital intensive. So I would say you're probably right. I, I think you're going to probably see a lot of investment and, and, and they just, people run out of cash, right? Just like, right. just like the fiber guys, they run out of cash and they sell it for almost nothing. And, and the people who made money on the fiber are definitely those folks that you're talking about. Yeah. Cause, and I think there's still dark fiber that hasn't been lit up in the United States where, you know, it's just kind of the leftovers of people who clearly the vision was right. This was the future. They just didn't have enough money to get the future. Well, they, and they were, they were just a little bit ahead of the game. 
also. People weren't really, they weren't even understanding why they needed fiber. And, 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 and the cloud hadn't really taken off yet, so that need for big bandwidth really hadn't taken off right. either. So it was, it was just a little bit too soon and a little bit undercapitalized. So does this get companies like uh, T-Mobile out of being just uh, phone providers and give them an opportunity to get into, you know, real network connectivity? Yeah, I think they're going to do what they do best still is, is, is they'll, they'll deliver that service, right? That, you know, but remember it, it's terrestrial. It's not a wire to the, to, to the building. So there's no installation needed. They're going to, they're going to sell it just like they sell a cell phone today. Um, but they're going to be competing, you know, you know, both residential and commercial for sure. That's going to, there'll be a big business, but they got those big companies, ATT, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, you know, the, all, all these guys, these, these are well capitalized companies and they'll, and, and if they don't have enough capital, I think they'll easily find the capital they need to build this out. Cause that is the big fight. Right. So it's interesting because this is a awfully big country. <laughs> When you think about, you know, all those rural areas, um, and and needing so many antennas for coverage, yeah, you know, I, because I, right now you can get an antenna that covers an entire county. <laughs> I believe I believe I will be retired before five um, Gs in small towns. Really? Yeah, I do. Um, it's just such a big investment. And remember, you need one every thousand feet. So you know, you're in a some rural town, you know, uh, north of us, you know, you, you know, once you get out of the metropolitan areas of California, there's a lot of small towns, right? Oh, yeah. And there's farms and, and places like that. They're, they're out of the city limits. You know, I grew up in a small town on the north coast of California that, and this, the, the city limits signs has 5,000 people. But if you ask people who live there, they say it's about 30,000, right? Yeah. Because most of the people live outside the city limits. Right. And uh, to put ta towers up to hit all those homes, I, I, you well, know. and even like the Berkeley Hills, right? <laughs> if you, yeah. When you think about, you know, people living in these, all of these little areas that are like, it's very congested, but uh, yeah. not necessarily easy to get to. So that's interesting. So does that mean 4G lives forever and, and you have I, a 4G, I, I, 5G network for? Yeah, I, I, I think the 4G is going to be along for quite some time still, for, for, mostly for the rural areas, you know, um, but your, your metropolitan areas, Towns the size of Sacramento, even though it's in California is considered a tier two city, in mo most states would be the biggest city in their in their state. Right. Right. Um, but bigger, you know, you, you know, your you know, your 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 cities that have a professional sporting franchise will be lit up, for sure. Um, and then it'll it'll go down from there. Right. Well, you know, it's funny because even Roseville by itself as a city is a big city in most states. True. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, California, we have what forty million, forty-five million people here. It's just right. we're 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 an anomaly for sure. It makes know. you wonder how many antennas you need for the greater Los Angeles area. You know, like starting in Anaheim and going up to Hollywood. <laughs> it, 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 they're and they're betting the farm on it. By the way, you know they 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 know that. You know they're they're trying to kill the the, the public network. You know they've been trying for a long time, and they'll eventually win. That copper network will eventually go away. They're not investing any money into it anymore. Right. I, I can tell you when you know if, if we're going into a building and they need uh, some copper services because there's nothing else there, and we're trying to use you know, EOC, you know, Ethernet over K, uh, over copper, finding enough uh, open and good pairs is getting almost impossible. That's and if you went and if you went to New York City, it actually is impossible. You know that oh. uh, Hurricane Sa Hurricane Sandy a few years back wiped out so much of their oh. facility uh, that that it, if it's not fiber or, or cable, it's almost impossible anymore. That is interesting. So here's a question: Who makes money pulling all that copper out of the ground and and selling it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Some yeah, thief in the middle of the night. <laughs> who, who does that now? <laughs> I have no idea. All right. So I have an international question for you. And by the way, if people haven't met. Jeff, let me just tell you, look for this beautiful face and, and shake his hand at the next conference you go to because he goes to a lot of conferences and he's just a great guy to hang out with and knows a lot about many, many things in our industry and other industries. So I know that you do a lot of charity work in Africa, but I have a financial and entrepreneur question. Is there an opportunity to be selling 5G in places like Africa where 
they're just going to skip over the whole wire in the ground uh, layer and just go to 5G. Well, I don't know if they're going to go to 5G for quite a while, but they're uh, because of the investment, they have 4G there now. It's it's pretty amazing. So you know, I've spent a lot of time on the ground in 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 Uganda, and uh, you walk right. Every person has a cell phone. A matter of fact, uh, mobile banking is is one of the biggest reasons why. So Orange, the the, the carrier Orange, is a humongous company, and all, on almost every corner, they have more Orange stores than we have Starbucks uh, per street. <laughs> right? I mean, they're they're everywhere, and they're these little shanties, by the way. And people go there with their mobile phone, and they borrow five dollars for the day. Or, or oh. for a week, or for a week, and then pay it back a week later. I mean, mobile banking is huge in the third so it's, world. So it's mobile banking and micro banking. Yeah, it's a uh, mobile banking by far is, is is one of the biggest reasons. But they get very inexpensive. These cheap little Chinese phones that cost two dollars to four dollars right. to buy. They're not they're not buying iPhones. <laughs> they're buying these really really inexpensive little phones, and but that and but they have they have connectivity now. You know, just, you know, Brazil was one of the first countries that really kind of, because they didn't have the infrastructure. You know, you go into most third world countries and, and uh, cause I've been to a, to a number, you have the palace, which is where the dictator lives. Right, right. And then about a one square mile around that palace is where all the consulates are because people want to do business there. Right. And there'll be a mall, you know, like Westfield, we are, our, our local, Field, malls are Westfield, right? Well, the malls over there in those countries are Westfield malls, by the way. And inside wow. those malls, you have all this, the normal uh, uh, Western stores and they have grocery stores. And the people who live in those consoles, that's where they shop. And there'll be a couple hotels there. You know, Western will have a hotel or Sheridan or somebody. But, but that all is in one square mile. And that whole area is wired. So all those people have, have had phone service, have at their homes for a very long time, you got outside of that wall where, where those consoles were, there was virtually zero connectivity until those antennas went up. Wow. And that is all over the world. And I saw the same thing in Indonesia, by the way, same exact thing when I, when I was there after the, the tsunami, I was working, doing some work over there, um, 2005, six, everybody had cell phone. But it was, it was so is this wireless. still an opportunity for, I mean, if people decided, hey, you know, I'm going to see if I can set up an IT business there? I, I, of course. Of course. I, I, I think it's more, uh, I, I think it should be more humanitarian and helping um, the folks over there getting set up. Um, but all the big players have, you know, you have just a distributorship over there, Dell and, 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 every, and everybody else, both, both in Africa, Indonesia, all the emerging, emerging uh, countries for sure. It's interesting because when you think about Superstorm Sandy, uh, that whole idea that, you know, weather comes in and destroys a bunch of stuff, well, it's going to destroy the oldest infrastructure first. <laughs> and yeah. so, uh, yeah. so we have opportunities to, to well, build on top of yeah. that. The, the other problem you have in, in the third world is uh, it's usually a king or a dictator that thinks they own everything. So a good example, uh, I'll tell you, is our school, which is out in the middle of the jungle in, in Uganda, well, uh, didn't have, there's no electricity, there was no internet, there, there, there was nothing out there. And so we were gonna use generators and then we got some solar panels, which was great, but we were gonna put an antenna on top of one of the villages. I talked to one of the satellite providers and they were willing to give free satellite to the school. Pretty amazing, right? Nice. Well, the government came in and the government says, well, no, that belongs to us. So if it's in their country, if there's internet in their country, it belongs to them. Wow. Yeah, so that kind of knocked that one down. <laughs> So. Chink in the armor. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, believe it or not, we're pretty much out of time. So we got about two minutes left. Tell me how we get in touch with you and uh, um, give me uh, 60 seconds on Concordus. Yeah. So Concordus application. So our whole premise is always to help keep our MSP partners relevant, right? So we, we've moved to the cloud. Uh, just you know, just like every you know, and, and how many cloud applications are are there out there? And how many different departments in, in the companies the MSPs are are uh, supporting, are, are buying their own services? Well, we found that integration became a big part, uh, a big issue for our uh, MSP partners. They're, they're systems integrators; they weren't necessarily software integrators. So we started a company, Concordus Applications, and which is their, their the core of what Concordus does is we're an integrator. Uh, uh, Dell bought Mule. Uh, uh, Boomi, uh, Salesforce bought uh, MuleSoft. These are big integration houses. 
we can do exactly what they can do for about the third the co about third the cost because we don't have the overhead. So uh -huh. we can so we can literally turn an MSP into a business consultant because they can they can do things that they don't have the that you know the bullpen internally to be able to do. Very cool. And so you can reach me uh, the easiest way, right? But is by calling me at nine one six eight two five two two six seven, or my email is jpons j p o n t s at datatel d a t a t e l solutions dot com. All right, and we'll put that down below so people can see it. And with luck, a thousand people will call you and give you a bunch of money in business. Yeah, well, Carl, it is always a pleasure uh, speaking with you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, I will see everybody here next time on the SMB Community Podcast. Thank you.